Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. Um, just as the former speaker, I've also chosen a bit of a narrow subject that is competition law and trust. However, I hope that you will forgive me uh, on the basis of the fact that I have chosen an area that I think most people have a basic knowledge about, and that is the Google and Google Shopping case. Yeah, I can see that. Um, just to, uh, to outline the background, antitrust and competition law can actually involve very, very large fines. And in some countries, you can actually get criminal inspection for infringing them. So the problem is that it is neither clear what the objective and the exact scope of a different provision of competition law is. So sometimes you can have a situation where it's not entirely clear what you are held accountable for. And the question is, of course, how open-ended a theory of harm can be levied against a company or a person. The case I'm going to share some observation about is the Google Shopping case. The first thing that is important to understand is that there's not really one Google case. In Europe, there's at least five cases, and some of them actually, in my opinion, might involve more than one case. In the US, you have one case with three charges. There is a German case, there's a British case, there's a Russian case, there's a case in France, and there's a case in Brazil. And I also understand that there is a case in China, and I could go on like that. The only case I'm going to really say anything about is the Google Shopping case. That is the case from 2017 in which Google was levied a fine of 2.42 billion euros. Just to, uh, to give you some background, I don't know, I know some of you know something about competition law because I've talked to you earlier. But the provision that was used against Google is Article 102, which essentially says that if you are dominant, you're not allowed to act anti-competitive. And then there's given a couple of cases about how anti-competitive behavior could look like. However, it is an open-ended, meaning that it is not predefined and you are not confined to the four examples listed in 102, meaning that other theories of harm can be advanced against companies. So the essential question that I'm going to share some observation about is, is it a fundamental right to actually understand what you are held accountable for, or as a minimum, be able to contact a lawyer who can explain it? And more importantly, is it a fundamental right before you're held accountable that you could predict that this would happen? Or, and should there be a reasonable link between, you know, the charges, the theory of harm, and the legal standards? Now, the good thing about the Google case is that most people have an opinion about it. And I ask you before I came here, do you think Google is guilty of having a malicious intent pursuing anti-competitive behavior? Yes or no? I believe not. You believe yes or no? No, you don't believe that. That's unusual. Most people actually say that they believe that. May, may I ask you, why do you think they're not guilty of anything? Firstly, I would like to say that uh, I guess it's not correct to, to say that I believe or not believe. <laughs> yeah, you're a lawyer, lawyer, right? You're a lawyer. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but my idea to this one is that uh, Google is has become so large, like enormous, like uh, organism that I don't think it's uh, fair to expect that uh, it can actually predict what effects it could have with yeah. it, with its actions. I mean, it's that's that's my point. That I don't think it's able even to control it. Yeah, herself. you know, I, I I very much share the opinion. But the uh, the point I really want to get to it. No offense, it doesn't really matter if you think they're guilty or not. Yeah. The essential question is. Can the prosecutor, which in this case is the European Community and the Commission, can they establish what we in criminal terms would say beyond reasonable doubts that this company is guilty 
of infringing a provision that we can describe? And could that company, in reasonable circumstances, either by themselves or contact a lawyer who would say, don't do this, stop breaking the law? That is the essential question. That is the essential question. And my opinion is that I think that the Commission has failed in this. It's not that I believe that a company is innocent. I think it's probably guilty of a lot of things. It's more a question that I see some embedded deficits in the decision. And I'm going to share these deficits, but in order to do that, I will have to explain what it is that Google has done and why the community believes this to be anti-competitive. And there is, in my opinion, two deficits. First of all, it's not really clear that there is sufficient level of link between the harm, the theory of harm, and the description of the uh, the legal standard, and secondly, the decision ordering Google to pay a fine also order it to stop infringing the law. But you know, two years down the road, we still do not believe, or still do not know to which extent they have been doing that, indicating that it is actually unclear how they should have done that. Now, the grievances levied against Google, Google Shopping, is very very old. It's actually from 2009, but essentially it's older than that. And the case came out in 2017, and part of it is still going on. Another one was decided in 2019, a couple of months ago, and all of these goes back to 2009. In order to understand it, you need to understand that when you go on the internet, there's essentially two ways you can search on the internet. You can do what we call a general horizontal search, which essentially search everything on the internet, or you can do a specialized, also called vertical search, where you only focus on some narrow subject. A horizontal search is essentially you go on the internet, you search for something, in this case, a university, and you get a lot of link, and we call these organic, also sometimes blue link, and that is a listing. And you know, you type in a word university and you get this link and hopefully this is what you're searching for. In order to get that, the browser search the entire internet. So everywhere the word university somewhere is associated, it shows up on this list. And this is of course only the top and you can go on. One of the, for, one of the conclusions that's of course important to understand, it's very important to be on the top. You know, if you're not on the top, but you're on page number 25, it's not very likely that anybody's going to go there. Here you have the general link, and here you have some sponsored list. That is a university to actually pay to get on top of it. But you also have something called a specialized services, where you only service, sorry, only search specific matters. For instance, those of you who are not from Riga, you know, most of you might have taken a plane, and you also have needed a hotel and you might have used either Expedia or Kayak or another specialized service that focusing on selling tickets to planes and vouchers to hotel. You know, in order to get from my hotel to the venue here today, I use Google Map, which is also a specialized service. So you have horizontal searches, which basically cover the entire internet, and then you have vertical searches that search for specific matters. Travel is one, but it could also watch going on, you know, what's going on in Riga tonight, and there are special services to provide for that. If you want to go to cinema, there are also services in which you can search what is the cinema and uh, film available in Riga tonight or tomorrow or whatever you want. You also got something that sort of bridges them. That is something called comparison shopping, and comparison shopping is not Amazon. In my opinion, Amazon is more of a specialized service to, to, to extend it is anything. Uh, comparison shopping is something to do a horizontal search across the internet and look for places where you can buy different kind of products that you are looking for. And this is actually Fountain, a very important company because that was the original plaintiff in the Google case. Google also got something called Google Services, which is in Google Shopping, which is their own services, which is a competitive alternative to Fountain. Now, let's assume you go on the internet, you want to search for something. You know, you get this clean and it's completely ready for typing in something. Let's assume that you are in trouble, you are in America, you need a lawyer. So you type in 
lawyer, actually a defense lawyer, because it's the police you have trouble with, and then you get different kind of search. You get an info box. Now you have search for a general lawyer, you know, and you get, this is an example of famous American lawyer. You also get some sponsored links, you know, those lawyers who has actually paid Google to show up on the map, and you get the traditional general searches. You know, this is very useful. Should you ever need a lawyer, you can just go on on Google, and you know, hopefully it will register where you are, and you just ask for a criminal lawyer, and it will direct you to the closest criminal lawyer. And you can even see what time it's open and closed, and it's basically a question about running there faster than the police can get you. We'll go to another situation. Let's assume that you are participating in a very important meeting. You are perhaps a candidate to a top job, but then you realize that you, are, you, know, you didn't bring your nice shoes with you, so you desperately need to buy a couple of shoes really fast. Then you go on the internet, browse, turn up your Google, you search for Christian Lapachang, very nice shoes, by the way. Here you get the traditional blue links. You know, you can get more information about these shoes. You can also get, you know, how do they look, so you can see what kind of uh, shoes do you want. You can get an indication of the local price index. You can get some additional information here, except from Copenhagen, you can actually see the map, this is where you find the closest shop, and you can actually see how it looked from the outside, and thereby you can very quickly get into a taxi, rush to it, instantly get a nice pair of shoes before the meeting actually, before the meeting actually starts. And we can actually see that this is the general search you have here. Here you have the vertical search here, and then you have something from the Google Shopping, and then you have no sponsored link in this situation. So Google calls this universal search, and essentially it blends horizontal, vertical, and shopping into one box, which in Google's opinion, and also in my opinion, in many perspectives, is superior. Google's business essentially evolves around selling advertisement. That is where it make all the money. However, to some extent, they also make money on shopping. But as far as I understand, it's not that much compared to the advertisement business. Now, the problem is that only Google's own offering are listed up here and included in pictures. The alternative, like for instance, Foundem and other offerings are only down here and in reality, not even on page one and two. So what Google does is that they reserve the premium displaying, the displaying on top of the list to their own offering while the competitors are relegated to a less attractive position in the organic lens. And that is essentially the anti-competitive behavior. On top, Google's competitors are allegedly made subject to different kinds of penalties it is not really clear, and as far as I understand, Google disputes it, so it's unclear if they are malicious intent. You get the perception, but you also get the perception that it might not be limited when you read the decision, so it's a bit open one. Then the commission tried to explain what is actually the legal side of the abuse, and that is done here. Abuse is what they have done, because it essentially involved reserving the premium displaying to Google, and the competitors are only displayed at the less attractive position. Bottom line, it is abusive that only Google's own offering is allowed to have the premium displaying on top with pictures, while the competitors are referred to the you know, organic lens and might even not be on page one. That is the abuse, that is the anti-competitive behavior the Commission has identified and think that is an infringement of 102. In my opinion, that makes no sense. And it makes no sense because, you know, on the Internet, somebody has to be on the top, you know. There can only be one on page one, and somebody else has to be number two, three, or four. And in my opinion, it makes a lot of sense to make your own offering on top because, you know, you don't really make any money on the search. What you make the money on is actually the shopping. So financially, self-preservation makes a lot of sense. And in my opinion, 
there is no room for identifying this as abusive unless you are within what is called the essential facility doctrine. And even here, it is debatable because you are still allowed to have a reasonable compensation. And, you know, this is just some example from Danish television. And my opinion is that it appears to be quite normal to list your own offering on top. You know, there's basically two big channels where I come from. One of them doesn't even display the competitor, and the only one only have the competitor here. So in my opinion, on the internet, it's quite normal to have your own offering on the top and relegate the competitor to a separate page. So I would actually say that self-favoring is quite normal when you come to the digital economy. I would also say that it's actually quite, um, quite useful, you know, assuming that you get into trouble in America, you know, I have no personal experience about it, but I, I love watching American civilization, you know, the, the cop shows up and you need a criminal lawyer really quick. You know, you just go on the internet, you find out where the closest criminal lawyer are. You can even see he's open, so you just simply jump into a taxi and say, take me there as fast as possible. So, you know, the way I see this is actually a superior offering, really offering uh, value for the consumer. And I fail to see where the consumer harm is in this. It also fit into the way I view the internet. You know, I'm old enough to remember when the internet was really dumb. When you went on the internet in the 90s and typed in something, you were confined to a number of boxes. So rather than searching on the internet, somebody else has defined things. Then you got this separation between general searches, vertical search, comparison shopping, and perhaps you could articulate that you have universal service that essentially blend these. Please remember the example with the poor lady who, in my opinion, was short of a nice pair of shoes, or the, uh, the uh, criminal infringer who need a lawyer really quickly. You know, universal service supplies that really quickly in a superior manner. That doesn't mean that the case is wrong and must be overturned. It's more question about these deficits. It should be granted that, you know, it has been established case by case that the concept of abuse is open-ended, you know. The community and the commission is not confined to predefined theory of harm. But of course, whenever you move outside of an established theory of harm, you risk the chance of having over enforcement identifying somebody wrongly guilty of anti competitive behavior and situation why it might not be true. It should also be noticed that, you know, if you read the case, it looks a lot like they are malicious intent. But when you really dig into it, most of it is essentially based on a lot of emails, and everybody knows that you know, if you just take all my emails, you can more or like less attract everything from it and establish whatever theory you want. So I wouldn't put too much into that. But of course, it is obvious that there is this self-favoring. So the question is essentially, is self-favoring abusive behavior, and could a company reasonable for seeing that? And I believe here is the essential part of the deficit, because I do not believe self-favoring is an infringement, and I do not believe the company should have been able to predict that. Malicious intent is, of course, something completely different. Moreover, you know, the entire case, if we accept that there are malicious intent, if we accept that they intentionally downgrade the competitor, it looks more like discrimination, but the case is not advanced as discrimination. And I believe that is just simply because it didn't really fit in to the predefined case law establishing what anti-competitive discriminatory behavior is. So to me, it even looked like there had been a bit of foreign shopping in the case. So I remain in a situation where I'm not convinced, and it gets even more troubling when you actually try to figure out what is the abusive behavior, because in some part of it indicated that some element abusive other part, other elements. So to me, it basically was a bit of carelessness when the commission drafted it. So perhaps it was even a, a, a bit too fast that it was sent out. And as I've already explained, it is actually unclear, at least from my perspective, what it is the commission wants the Google to do. They just simply said, stop breaking the law. But as it's unclear what is actually considered abusive, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation, you don't really know if you are correcting it. And, you know, after two years, we're still short of an official statement from the Commission that Google is now or is not now in compliance. Yeah. 
and other things can be, uh, can be discussed. So I personally believe that the case is suffering some serious deficits and there is much to discuss in courts. But we don't really need to, uh, we don't really need to wait that because you, know, you had a strong uh, feeling that the case was wrong. And do you still think that? Yes. Yes, okay. Now you're even more convinced, right? Yes, uh, especially about the argumentation. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. But how does other feel? Do you think that uh, do you think Google is guilty? You look like you feel that. I think I don't. I I'm not. Didn't read this case in details. You, as I see, as I saw, see that you are dealing this case and you read the decision in details, you know everything. Yeah, it is a good point you made on this, uh, that um, undertakings really sometimes do not know what behavioral will be uh, abusive. But uh, to, to my mind, uh, if, you are, if you look at Google, they, they, sh they have to know that uh, uh, they are in dominant position. Agree. Agree. Yes, that's one fact, and they there. There was, as I remember, there was Google initiated one strategy in the market. They founded something like a frugal or something like this that was not success, successful. And uh, after this, they changed the strategy and applied new strategy, which, as a result, as a result, as the commission concluded, excluded others from yeah. this general search, and. Uh, if I understand commission, okay, one thing is a theory, theory of harm they have to present to prove and other have to undertake and have to know. But the other side is that such actions did, they, just such actions have had an effect on the market because these comparison shop, shopping services was, uh, I think, I read it's, um, more than 10, 20 times searches was dropped. Yeah. But and in these situations, it creates some links with, yeah. there is causality with the behavior of Google. And I, I don't know, we, in competition proceedings, we do not oblige to pr prove intent. But as I understand, commission looked at the in, in issue, internal documents of the Google, they exchange internally. Oh, looking on this investigation, all this um, uh, evidence covered by the commission and facts, uh, I think in this situation, I am closer to the, those who are believe that commission uh, was right. <laughs> but I am uh, for, from the competition authority and this situation. Uh, no, but I am. I think that you uh, you focus on the absolutely correct element. I have no illusion whatsoever. Google is dominant. I also believe that they probably have some kind of uh, not necessarily malicious intent, but of course they have a strategy of foreclosing the competitor. And assuming the calculation, of course, there's a lot of calculation in the system that are correct. There's also anti-competitive behavior. The problem is, of course, that the definition, what is it exactly that you're doing that we don't want you to do? You know, that is the self-favoring. That's why I personally decide not to be part of this anymore because I, think, I don't think self-favoring is abusive. And as a lawyer, we have this fundamental right that the law must describe in a manner that you reasonably can foresee is what you're not allowed to do. And I had... I do not believe that we could have foreseen that self-favoring on the internet was abusive. And that's where I personally believe that the link bring down. But they are dominant, yes. They are most likely engaged in what look like anti-competitive behavior. They probably have some kind of foreclosing strategy. Malicious intent, we can discuss that. There's a lot of document indication, but I believe that if there has been a smoking gun, the commission would put it on page one, and they have not done that. So I don't feel convinced about it. But where the link breakdown is that I do not believe that the commission in a convincing manner has established beyond reasonable doubt, as you would say in a, 
a criminal case that the hand fit the glove or the glove fit the hand. That's where I think the problem is. But this is actually one of the most exciting cases because, you know, I think I'm probably the only one who has read it nine times without being paid for it. And I still fail to understand uh, the full grasp of it. And I'm so much looking forward to, uh, to the court proceeding. And I'm personally so sorry that the uh, suit is, uh, is ending and not uh, going on anymore. But that's another story. Okay, any questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, my question mainly relates more towards uh, the consumer side of uh, using Google and searching for whatever they want to search. Um, well, my personal opinion is that it also greatly depends on the consumer, uh, uh, consumers themselves, what are their expectations. Because even though um, Google may be, uh, may be advertising certain services, uh, also attorneys, and so on. But if a uh, consumer will be dissatisfied either way, then I believe that it's just uh, uh, that they will not be uh, basically existent there anymore. Yeah, yeah. Is it a question or? Uh, that was just a remark. OK. Right. Any other? Yes, it is interesting to, that you said about um, that Google acted reasonably uh, about um, but knowing that he is uh, the Google in a dominant position. Of course, if there is question maybe from a legal point of view, is there other possibilities to act uh, without excluding or discriminating such evidently uh, these possible competitors in downstream markets. And in this situation, this, this is, I think, the question, is there alternatives to, of course, you are, as I understand from your presentation, that the, the alternative for Google is that uh, Google is obliged now to put competitors on the first. Yeah, which no, that, makes no sense. And yes, <laughs> that's, a, that's a completely illogical, yes. And this, yeah, yes, I agree. Uh, and it, it's interesting how Google will implement this uh, decision and how, we will ch uh, how the Google will change the behavior. And yes, it's an interesting point about reasonable behavior that Google did. And there's, from one point of view, yes, it is. Yes, but you know, I'm, I'm also, uh, uh, I understand they have changed something because I have seen a strong indication that it is changed but I do not fully understand. But what is interesting is that, you know, I think that Google Shopping is the weak case. The Android case and the AdSense is probably much stronger from a legal perspective. But what's interesting is that, you know, the Google Shopping case, you have the shopping involved in it. But in reality, this is actually the true case that is interesting. Google Search, Google Maps, and that was what the British case was about. And the Google Shopping case, you just put in the shopping element because it's easier to see that the consumer might not benefit if they do not direct me to the, the cheapest products. But here, you know, if they come about, you really have the interesting case because here there is absolutely no consumer harm as far as I'm concerned. And then the case might actually be about what is the objective of competition law? Is it consumer welfare or is it something else? Oh, that's a question here. Well, it's a problem with, the, with Google search, not simply that Google is mixing too many services into one. And that uh, when we have, the, the, say, when we look at ele electricity markets or gas markets, we had the idea of unbundling the various services to make sure that you don't influence or you don't self favor by. Uh, obst obstructing others that want to use your network by um, charging them excessive prices, etc. And the uh, and the idea simply was you, you can't do both. Either you're a comparison site or you're a search or you're a seller. Yes. Do you have a mobile phone? I do. So do I. Let's uh, let's apply this evolution of internet to mobile phone. You know, you look just as old as I am. How? Uh, yeah, we are equally bold, right? 
the first mobile phone, you remember them? They were big and they were dumb, right? And then we got, uh, then we got somebody with SMS in it, you know, and I assume you have a smartphone today, right? This is actually, you know, it's a phone. It has SMS, it also has internet, and it had calendar in it, and also got access to the internet. So this is actually a smartphone. It has almost everything in it. You know, you can even talk to it, and it search for you. So the point is that maybe the internet is just like telephones. They are developing, and nobody, you know, nobody believe that this is an unacceptable bundle. This is evolution, and I would articulate that Google searching might equally be viewed as evolution that just simply are superior because please remember what they partly is doing is that they have this box where you get everything in one search you know you don't need to you know you can just type in the shoes you need and you instantly get where can i get it what should i actually expect you know assume that you're looking for a present for your wife and then you say, ah, okay, uh, maybe I should buy something else because this is quite expensive. So the point is you get everything at the same. So I would actually articulate this is actually about bundling and innovation just as the smartphone. <clears throat> You're totally right. And I just wrote an article about um, bundling as a consumer protection problem. Not in, in this, in the sense of the Google search, but about um, telecommunications, including pay TV, including... Um, a service provider who, who um, provides the service for your whole house and you, you're locked in and you can't do anything anymore without risking your whole life breaking down in one go. So I mean, just taking that further, um, progressive progress, uh, innovation. I mean, they, they also sell their bundlings and, and their, their combination of ever more services as innovation and progress and it's making consumer life even e ever easier. But at the same time, it's you cut you complete entirely captured. Yeah. So there's yeah, both sides to that. That's life, and uh, <laughs> my uh, my my presentation, by the way, is, is based on a paper, and it's available from uh, social science research. And please download it because right now there's only 76 who has downloaded, and uh, just like people on on Facebook and Twitter, I love a lot of uh, uh, hits. So please uh, download it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>